Hello and welcome to this presentation about Oracle Database Architecture Basics. To quickly define what is an Oracle database, it's one type of database management system called a relational database management system. So with that RDBMS, you have data that you can insert into that system. Once they are in your system, you can modify your data, which means you can update them or delete them. And uh, essentially the, the last thing you can do is to retrieve the data. So three functionalities, insert, modify, and retrieve. So what type of data can you manipulate with an Oracle database? Well, it can be text, it can be numbers, it can be pictures, it can be movies, sound, any type of file, and virtually any type of data. So where is the data? Located on disks, obviously. And where are the disks? On a disk server. So how do I access data? using the Oracle software. The first thing you need to do is to install that Oracle software. So the question is, where is this software located? Well, it can be on the disk server itself. It can be on a server on its own and the database residing somewhere else. It can be on the client, typically your desktop, or it can be in the middle tier. So what is the difference between all of those cases? All kinds of possibilities. Here is, here is one where everything is accessed from a single box. So you have the client accessing the server software that access the disks and the data. All that on the same machine. This well-known configuration here where you have the client accessing the server software and the disks through the network. You also have the possibility for your client to access the server and your server accessing the disks which reside on the disk server somewhere else. If you are using distributed database, you can with your client connect to the first database and in turn connect to another one residing on a, a different server. And last case here that we are looking at, if you have no client installation and just use a browser, you connect to your middle tier using your browser and the middle tier software is connecting to um, the server software to access your database. So what is this Oracle software doing? You cannot even imagine. But in short, you have two essential things to remember. The instance and the storage. In the instance, you find memory structures, essentially the system global area, also called the SGA, and the Oracle software. At the storage level, you will find your database files. And there are many of them. So why would you need an SGA? Essentially for two reasons, to scale and share data. How do you size the SGA? You use a well-known file called an initialization parameter file, which location is well known on your server. And that parameter file contains a list of parameters uh, that are here to size the various components of your SGA. Now, how do you locate the database files? It's very similar, still using this initialization parameter file. However, there are, might be many data files and you can add them on the fly. So that's why uh, there are one important category of files that you need to remember is the control file, which lists all the other database files like data file, redo log file, and temp files, which are not listed here. So from your initialization parameter file, all you need to specify is the location of these control files. So that, in turn, we can determine uh, the list of the other files. So that's why control files are very important and they are, they are always mirrored. So how do I access my data? Essentially from two locations, the data files, first of all, and then in the SGA. So on the SGA, you have a special dedicated data rack called the database buffer cache. And on the disk, you, you find your data files, which contains the data. In the middle, you have the server process. So with your user process at the client, you connect to that server process. And this server process either reads the data file or find the information directly uh, inside the, the database buffer cache. What is this buffer cache for then? And again, it's the same purpose of the SGA is to share and scale. So if you look at this picture here, 
imagine that you have multiple users trying to access the, the same data. So the first one is going to read it from the disk, but once it's in the buffer cache, all the others are going to share it and use it from there. Avoid reading the disks many times, which is much faster. Great, but how about updates? So typically, again, it's your server process that is responsible for modifying the data. So as a user, when you issue an update, the server process is going to modify uh, the data directly in the SGA, in the buffer cache in this case. And from time to time, you have a special dedicated background process called the database writer, which responsibility is to flush the modified data back to the disks. The important thing to realize here is that it's done in a desynchronized way. Great, but what about losing server process? So everything is done through your server process. So imagine that you modify the data in your cache and before you commit your transaction, you mean you agree with your modification, the server process is gone for some reason. So you are in this situation. And in this case, there is also a dedicated background process called PMON, Process Monitor, who's going to roll back that transaction and modify the data back to what it was before. And this is done automatically by this uh, process. That's great, but how about losing cached data then? Two possibilities. The data on disks, same as in cache, illustrated here. So both the data on disks and in cache are the same, so if you lose the cache, then it's not a problem. Now let's have a look at the other case, where the data on disks and in cache differ. You are in this situation. So you modify the data, you committed the data, for example, but it has not yet been flushed to the disks by the database writer. So you lose it in this case. Question is, are you going to lose your updates? Obviously not. But now, to understand it, it's getting a bit more complex. And we need to talk about blocks. And blocks are the I.O. units. They, can, uh, they contain table rows. And this is illustrated here on this diagram. So you have the table, the rows, and we call that the logical representation. And on disks, you have blocks and this is the physical representation. And each block mapped to a certain number of rows in your tables. So what happens when you modify a row? We are using light writes instead of writing blocks. And we write what we call redo entries. Let's have a look at what, what is going on here. So first of all, you try to modify the second row in this table. What, what happens? So you do that through your user process, going through the server process with an update, and then that server process is going to update two things, essentially, the block in the buffer cache, as well as another buffer, which is called the redo log buffer. But the big difference is, is that in the redo log buffer, we just record the modifications that you did. So essentially, the modification that you did to one or many columns in one particular row. So the modification is, um, is then commit. So as the, 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 as the user process, you want to validate your transaction, your modification. So what is happening then is that you have a special background process called the log writer process, who's going to flush the redo log buffer to special files that we call redo log files. And the idea here is to flush only the modifications you have done to your table rows instead of flushing the block directly. One block can be 8K in size, for example, while a redo entry can be very small. So that's much more efficient doing it this way. How does that help in case I lose the cache? Well, we can always reapply redo entries. And this is illustrated here. So in case you lose the cache, so imagine that you committed your data and you lose your uh, instance. Well, the next time you restart your instance, there is a special dedicated process called System Monitor 
that is going to reapply the redo logs entries to the data file. So a redo log file is very important and indeed. That is why a redo log file should always be mirrored as illustrated on this diagram here. So here the log writer, whenever it flushes the redo log buffer to the file, is duplicating its writes to two different files, two re different redo log files in the same redo log group. So what happens if I lose one? You can always use the remaining one as shown here. So you still have one redo log files in which you can write. So what happens when a redo log file is full then? Two things essentially. You switch to another redo log file group. Whenever you create a database, there is a prefix number of redo log file groups that are created, generally three. And the idea is that you st when you finish writing to one of them, you switch to the next one and when you reach the last one, you switch back to the first one in a loop, overwriting its content. We are not illustrating this here, but um, just remember that once you are done with uh, one read log file group, you start writing to the next one. As illustrated here. Which cause a checkpoint to occur. So there is a special process called the checkpoint process. And the idea is that whenever you're going to switch to a new redo log file group, the checkpoint process is going to request the database writer to flush any modifications outstanding in the buffer cache back to the data file. And once this is done, it's going to record that fact into the control files using a checkpoint structure represented here by the green tick. Essentially that means um, that from the control file we definitely know that for each data file we are up to a certain level of synchronization. Optionally, the previous group, the redo log file group, is archived. So there is a special background process if you want to run your database in archive log mode, that particular process called the archiver process is started and each time a redo log file is full, it is automatically archived by this archiver process. So why would you archive a redo log file? Well, in case you lose a data file and you have a data file backup, you can reapply the archived redo log files. And this is what we try to illustrate here with the timeline. So let's imagine that at time T1, here is your data file, and you create a data file backup. Then you start modifying the data, and while you are modifying the data, obviously you are generating redo log files. And they are automatically archived in this case. So you reach up that time T3 here illustrated on the slide and let's imagine that at time T4 you have a crash. Let's suppose that somebody uh, made an error by removing the file. So the file is lost. What is happening is that at time T5 what you can do is restore your data file backup as it was at time T1. But obviously uh, when you do the, the restore you are back at time T1 and you lose all the updates that were done since then. However, because you have archived the redo log files, you are able to reapply them to your data file. And this is illustrated here at time T6 where you reapply the first one. At time T7 you reapply the second one. Time T8 the third one. Time T9 the last one. And at time T9 here you are back at time T4 essentially when um, you lose your data file. So we went through all the basics of this architecture. Hopefully that was your full and thank you very much for listening.